Welcome to this episode of MoGuard TV. I'm your host, Staff Sergeant Clayton Fither, and I'm a recruiter in the Kansas City area for the Missouri National Guard. In this episode, we'll look at how artillerymen are putting a year's worth of training to the test with some big guns. We'll witness soldiers and airmen as they push through the demanding mental and physical challenge that is air assault school. We'll catch up with the Homeland Response Force as they conduct their quarterly training, and we'll meet the daughter of a Missouri Guardsman after she gets a big surprise at her high school graduation. For our first story, we're going to head down to Fort Sill, Oklahoma and spend some time with the 1st Battalion, 129th Field Artillery as they conduct their annual training. About an hour and a half southwest of Oklahoma City sits 98,000 acres of land that is home to various wildlife such as coyotes, snakes, turkeys, and elk. But this is not the kind of place to take a nature walk and find some peace and quiet. This is the site of the artillery ranges at Fort Sill, and when you hear a voice yell fire, things are about to get loud. Fire! The Missouri National Guard's 1st Battalion, 129th Field Artillery, spent a large portion of their annual training in April working with the M777 Howitzer. It is a 16-foot-long piece of British craftsmanship that packs quite a punch. These soldiers cherish the time that they get to live fire these guns and put into practice the skills that they hone during their monthly drill weekends. During the year at home station, we do a lot of dry fire missions. We train on our positions. We perfect how we operate the howitzer. Annual training is the time when we get the live ammunition. We get to send rounds down range and we get to see the results of our hard work throughout the year. This is what we do. We love to shoot. We're at home station. I'm pretty much just in the office doing some paperwork, catching up on some maintenance stuff. I love it out here. I might not get the shower, but you know it's worth it in the end. It's a chance to get away from work and my civilian life and come out with all of my friends and family that I've made in the Army. It's a chance to put your skills that you've been trained to work. This annual training was a unique opportunity to perform direct fire, where soldiers can actually see the round hit its target just a few hundred yards in front of them. Direct fire was awesome. I never shot direct fire before, so I liked it a lot. You can actually see the round just fly. Usually when we go on a mission, the round will go straight up and you'll see it for like a split second, but here you can see it like go and travel, spiraling down, next thing you know, boom. For a lot of soldiers, that was you know, the culmination of their AT because no one had ever done that. That was a, you know, a big motivating factor, and you've seen a lot of high motivation during this AT for that. We've been doing a lot of progressive training, and we've, we're doing more complex missions. Whenever you come out and initially see it, it's hard to gauge how far we've come because these weapon systems are fairly new, only five years old. We're at a run pace on training, and we're doing very well. The first of the 129th is made up of three batteries, Alpha, Bravo, and Delta. There is a historical significance to the lack of a Charlie battery. During World War I, Harry Truman commanded Delta Battery. Before that, he was a, a lieutenant in Bravo Battery. After he became president, they reorganized the Army and went to three battery battalions. They used to have larger ones. After they redesignated it, they kept Delta Battery due to Harry Truman's service there. So we have the only Delta Battery in the United States Army. The battery they took over, I guess, had gone through several commanders. He was the one, his leadership style was able him to take command and hold it. And then while he was commanding his troops, it was famous to him saying, I'd rather be commander of Delta Battery than be president of the United States. In addition to the three firing batteries, the 1st of the 129th Battalion has two other units that play a big role in running successful missions. The 1128th Forward Support Company, which handles support aspects such as maintenance and food, and the Headquarters and Headquarters Battery, or HHB, which gives out mission orders to the firing batteries and also contains the medical staff. The medical section of the 
129 is myself, the physician assistant, and we have 13 combat medics that support the gun batteries during live fire. The first of the 129th could not run a successful AT without the support of these personnel who are off the firing line. As an artillery battalion, we have 12 guns, but we have 500 people to support those 12 guns. Whether it's from the cooks, to supply, that makes sure you get everything that you need, to the ammo sections that go and draw the ammo and have it ready for you when you're ready for it. HHB is kind of the element that you don't see. It's not quite as glamorous, I guess, as the guys on the gun line, but it's just as important. They definitely couldn't get their mission done without the guys behind the scenes doing all the hard work to get the rounds downrange. Four, six, three, eight, four, two, three, eight, four, two. At the heart of the headquarters battery is the Fire Direction Center, or FDC, and the Operations Center. Fire Direction Center is under the TAN camo netting and they're the ones controlling the fires uh, for the three batteries, designating who gets the missions and coordinating with the observers on the hill. And then on the other side is the Operations Center, so they're more movement control, control and supporting elements, ammo, making sure that gets to the gun line, so they really work hand in hand. During the annual training, the HHB picked up and moved a couple times. They go from trucks rolling into an empty field to being fully set up in about an hour. Another behind the scenes support element is the retrans. Two soldiers are posted up on a small mountain to aid the fire direction center in communicating with the gun batteries. Our team is comprised of two soldiers, myself, the retransmission chief, and a lower enlisted soldier. We are given a grid coordinate, a location on where they have scattered out would be best for our communication. And we are sent up here in the vehicle to set up all of the antennas and everything you see around us. The radios that we use, the SENGARs, are line of sight radio systems. So if you have obstacles in the way, such as the hills or mountains that are on Fort Sill, it's difficult to get a direct line of sight between the two points. So we go up on those obstacles and set up. The M777 requires a minimum of a seven-man team to operate it. Every soldier on the team has a specific role. When you watch a gun team in action, you can't help but think of a pumped up high school football team. But don't let the intensity fool you. Everything is done with a purpose of efficiency and a mind for safety. As field artillerymen, we're masters of check and recheck, and it's what sets us apart from other branches. Every step has a check and a recheck, and we're very accurate. That's what keeps us safe. That's what keeps the round going where it needs to go. The battalion didn't stop firing after the sun went down. That was just an opportunity to break out the illumination rounds. These munitions are used as a bright light source when the infantry is trying to gain the upper hand on an enemy at night. If we're targeting something at night, like you got an infantryman on the ground, he can put an illumination round up and then he can shoot the target that he sees in that area that he's watching. The 1st of the 129th Battalion was visited by members of leadership on the same day they were taking part in direct fire. Make sure you're passing it up through your chain of command so that we can help get the equipment and everything else that you need to support uh, your training. We had Colonel Martin, the Brigade Commander, and then Sergeant Major Sportsman, the Brigade CSM, and then we also had Colonel Terry Mass. It meant a lot for us for them to come see our training because they support us, obviously, help us develop all the training plans and execute those throughout the year. And I think they're really impressed with what they saw. Direct fire range is always a treat for people to see. And then just seeing all the different aspects of our mission that we've coordinated and brought together. And I think that them getting out and seeing the soldiers and the soldiers seeing that for their support to our soldiers is really important for the whole operation has been tried and found worthy to be numbered as one of our trusted members. The first of the 129th surprised Command Sergeant Major Sportsman and Colonel Mast with an award ceremony where they presented them with medals for the Ancient Order of St. Barbara, one of the highest honors for field artillerymen. Fire. Both Colonel Mast and Sergeant Major Sportsman were originally from the 129th, grew up through our ranks, and then obviously have achieved great success. We just wanted to show our appreciation to them. Their influence has helped us to get to where we're at today. I believe there's less than 15 of those our battalion's ever presented, so 
It's a pretty elite group of artillerymen. Command Sergeant Major Sportsman and Colonel Mast each got a chance to fire a howitzer from Bravo Battery as a final hurrah for their time in the battalion. The 1st of the 129th had a successful annual training, and it's clear to see why the battalion has an excellent reputation and continues to attract outstanding soldiers to artillery. After the break, we'll drop in on air assault school and watch Missouri Guardsmen take their repelling skills to a higher level. For over 375 years, our nation's citizen soldiers have sacrificed, struggled, and triumphed at home and abroad. Through resolve, resilience, and readiness, our Army National Guard continues its proud legacy. As citizen soldiers, we are your next door neighbors. We're your colleagues in schools, offices, and factories. In every corner of America, the Army National Guard is nearby. We have a stake in the safety and security of our communities. After all, that is where we live. We serve in Afghanistan, Iraq, the Balkans, Africa, the Sinai, and the United States Southwest border. We are citizens. We are soldiers. We are your neighbors. We are always ready. We are always there. The Army National Guard. Over 375 years of value and vigilance. The Missouri National Guard hosted the Air Assault School at Camp Crowder in Neosho, Missouri. Soldiers and airmen from regional National Guard and Reserve units, including Missouri Guardsmen, attended the course. The 10-day course provides instruction on conducting air assault operations, repelling techniques, and helicopter sling load procedures. A prerequisite to enter the air assault course is making it through zero day, the day before the course begins. It is a grueling day of physical endurance, which begins at 4 a.m. with a cordial introduction by the air assault instructors that is immediately followed by group exercises, also known as smoke sessions. After the morning warm-up, the air assault candidates must complete a two-mile run in under 18 minutes. Candidates that come in over the time limit are disqualified from entering the course. We do the prerequisites for zero day to ensure that people can meet the actual physical rigors of the course. The final physical endurance test of zero day is the obstacle course, which is made up of nine obstacles. The candidates are taken through each obstacle to understand proper technique and the requirements to pass. You will keep a low profile. You will keep your face in the dirt. The most challenging part of this course really was just getting started with zero day. Between the obstacle course and the smoke sessions, it was, it was tough. We've all done obstacle courses before, but this one was a lot different than anything I had experienced. It was definitely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's not made for short people. That was the most difficult aspect of it. To me, the biggest challenge was the weaver, just because climbing in between the logs and getting up to that apex was pretty exhausting. I went into the course knowing very well that it would be difficult. My NCOs told me to keep a strong head about it, be focused, and work hard. You have to want to be here as all of the air assault candidates volunteered to attend the school. I'd heard it was challenging and I wanted to face that challenge and it was a unique opportunity for our unit to be offered a slot. I was always up for a new challenge and wanted that honor to wear the wings. I volunteered mostly for the history behind the badge and the prestige that goes along with it and I wanted to be a part of that history. Having successfully completed the prerequisites from zero day, the candidates are officially enrolled in the air assault school. So you have three different phases of air assault. First phase is combat assault phase where we teach them about rotary wing aircraft to include to be able to conduct an actual air assault mission. So we learned the different types of helicopters, their capabilities, safety procedures, and how to approach them, how to exit them in an emergency. You're given a ton of information, and you only have, you know, maybe 48 hours before your first test. 
Then you move on to phase two, which is the most difficult portion of the air assault course. We teach them about basic sling loads and characteristics to include inspection and rigging. So they have to be able to know what each aircraft can hold on their cargo hook, whether or not that actual load that they're rigging is suitable for whatever piece of equipment is picking it up, inspecting four of the six common sling loads in the U.S. Army's arsenal. In 2011, during some of the flooding up from the Missouri River, soldiers from the Missouri Army National Guard slung load sandbags with uh, 35th Cab helicopters, and they placed them where they could not get troops or trucks in on the levees. We've got probably six or seven guys now that are going to be air assault qualified in my unit. So I'm really hoping it's going to open the door for our unit in the future just to be able to utilize helicopters as a means of moving stuff around. In a case of an emergency, we'd be able to help out with loading up supplies or moving things around. Phase three is repelling operations, which we teach them to repel off a repel tower. And then we culminate all that with a 90 foot repel from an aircraft the day before graduation. It's the first time I've ever been in a helicopter. Repelling out of one on my first time was definitely nerve wracking. But as soon as I saw them fly in, nothing but excitement. I've never been in a Black Hawk before. It's definitely something special. Once you get up there, you're like, oh man, this is so awesome. And then they're like, all right, time to get out. The Air Assault School is taught by instructors from the Army National Guard's Warrior Training Center based in Fort Benning, Georgia. All the instructors are National Guard from across the United States. On average, we have about nine to 11 courses a year, so I manage the entire course. I have 14 instructors that work for me, and we travel the world and teach air assault. You will dress all cadre as air assault sergeant. Do you understand? As the host state for the school, Missouri Guardsmen from the 140th Regiment Regional Training Institute were tasked to support the Air Assault Cadre. We bring all these people together and we provide the instructors and the cadre of the Warrior Training Center with all the needs that they require to make these courses go. And that means moving water, getting light sets, distributing MREs and, and training devices. <laughs> The final event to pass for graduation is a 12-mile ruck march. The Air Assault candidates up to this point have made it through nine days of training and must complete the march in under three hours to earn their Air Assault wings. Twelve days ago, 205 soldiers arrived with hopes of earning the Air Assault badge. With us here today are 149 Air Assault soldiers that have earned the right to wear that coveted badge. You are an elite soldier, you are an elite airman. Thank you for your participation. You are the experts that are gonna carry it out for us in the future. I am proud of you. The Missouri National Guard, the Adjutant General of the State of Missouri is proud of you. The new Air Assault graduates are authorized to wear the Air Assault badge, which were pinned on by family members, friends, or instructors. A symbol of the graduates' achievement and new skill sets. You kind of hear stuff about the course, but you don't really know what they've been through, and so I'm really proud now to wear them and say that I've done those same things. There are very few females that usually make it through the course. It makes me a little bit more proud to say that I will have graduated from Air Assault. The new Air Assault Guardsmen will enhance their unit's capabilities to support the National Guard's dual state and federal mission. Coming up after the break, we'll see how members of the Homeland Response Force prepare for natural and man-made disasters. Recently, the Missouri National Guard's Homeland Response Force conducted its quarterly required training. 
which consisted of five days of classroom, hands-on, and online courses at the Tiger Hotel in downtown Columbia. The Homeland Response Force is a, uh, a DOD enterprise that's given to National Guard units, and they're responsible for FEMA region. So we're responsible for FEMA Region 7, which is Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska. And uh, basically any incident that were to happen in any of those states, we'd be the first ones to respond both on a seaburn type event or a, a natural disaster and help save lives and mitigate human suffering. We're kind of a front runner in developing this, this school. So basically we're bringing in members of the Homeland Response Force, mainly the new members. They need a certain amount of specialized training, so we bring them in for a full week, get all their training done. They leave the week with six specialized certificates that we issue. They're basically qualified as a member of the Homeland Response Force. Soldiers and airmen serving in the Homeland Response Force come from a variety of different military occupational specialties and units, bringing together unique skill sets. In addition to training students from across the state of Missouri, one guardsman in attendance was a member of the California Air National Guard. I'm from the 144th Medical Group in Fresno, California. I'm a 40051 medical technician. My job in the HERF in general is to provide triage to patients, basically make sure people stay alive, get them you know, to the correct care of the doctors and nurses, and get them to the hospital. Here, I was taking their blood pressure, the heart rate, and the respiration. We do that before they get in a chemical suit to kind of get a baseline of their vitals. So when they go in the uh, chemical suits, you know, it's really hot in there. Depending on the times they, they go in there for, you can make it dehydrated. So, and then we take them when they get out to see if they've uh, changed in any way, if their blood pressure has gone up, if your heart's beating too fast, you might yeah, think. Yeah, you guys are in the one percentile of trained personnel in the military. At the conclusion of the training, the guardsmen received certification on a variety of different skill sets, each integral to the accomplishment of their mission. Our final story introduces us to the daughter of a Missouri Guardsman, a young woman who got the perfect graduation gift. Mari Buckner graduated from Smith Cotton High School in Sedalia, Missouri. This ceremony was something to experience and share with her friends and family. But she was sad that one person in particular couldn't be in attendance that night. Her father, Master Sergeant Mark Buckner, had been stationed in South Korea since June of 2015. Mari last saw her father in October. Missouri National Guard soldiers and airmen continually support missions away from home for extended periods of time. Although the time away can put stress on a family, that type of sacrifice is typical of so many Guard families. Mari Savannah Buckner. As Mari walked across the stage to receive her diploma, a special announcement was made. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to help me welcome home Sedalian Mark Buckner from active duty. This is the first time he's seen his daughter in over seven months. Mari, we hope you can like this along. This was truly the best graduation gift Mari could have received. It means everything. I didn't think that he was going to be able to make it. Oh, it's a great thing to see her graduate. It's been a great experience. The welcome home celebrations mean the world to so many families. Master Sergeant Buckner had a plan all along. He saved up his leave time. He knew this was a moment he wasn't going to miss. I knew I would have enough leave built up. I knew I'd be back. This was a homecoming on multiple levels for Master Sergeant Buckner. He was a member of the very first graduating class of Smith Cotton High School in 1988. He was also a Missouri National Guard recruiter in Sedalia for five years. A lot of my friends were here in the audience too, so just to hear my name announced also, I felt like I was going to graduation again. Mari was thankful to her father's commanding officers for allowing him to be there. I wish they were actually here so I could thank them. She had some encouraging words for fellow children of military parents who are deployed or stationed overseas. Just be strong, think about them in spirit, think the, about them being there, and eventually you will see them again. It's not going to be forever. It is now my honor to introduce the commander of the Missouri National Guard, the Adjutant General, Major General Steve Danner. Thank you, Sergeant Fiddler, and thank you viewers for watching this episode of MoGuard TV. In the Missouri National Guard, we champion a culture of readiness. During annual training exercises, our guardsmen put to the test everything they've learned during monthly drill weekends. We also focus on ways to empower our organization 
soldiers and airmen have many opportunities to improve their skills. Air Assault School is a perfect example. Guardsmen graduate from this course as more confident individuals. They are eager to share their knowledge with others in their units. We saw how Guardsmen took part in quarterly Homeland Response Force training. Staying up on the newest technologies and practices enables us to be fully prepared in the event of a natural or man-made disaster. And finally, it is important to remember that Guard families make sacrifices right alongside our soldiers and airmen, and we couldn't do what we do without their support. Their sacrifice allows the Missouri National Guard to be always ready, always there, to serve our state and nation when called upon. On behalf of Governor Jay Nixon and our nearly 12,000 soldiers and airmen, thank you for your support.